removal of the children from one country to another, and uh, in, from one often from one legal system into another legal system, uh, and uh, therefore that the approach of nationalism, patriotism, or other suspicion of foreigners um, is not an appropriate uh, approach. The approach should be a strong approach with very few exceptions that are contemplated of uh, applying the convention and leaving it to the country of ordinary residents to determine uh, whether the, the children should be allowed to reside somewhere else uh, or whether the children should stay in the place of residence. So that's basically what I came to say and everything is said brilliantly in my article and uh, I'm very glad Justice Forrest has um, made his decision and that it was upheld by the High Court to give um, at least one of the six cases a case affirming the operation of the Convention uh, and now we will have the interesting bit, Kira Day. You, you can express your point of view. You may not agree with me about this. You may think, well, if a child is abducted, there must have been some purpose in it. Or if a child is abducted and the case comes before a court uh, and there are exceptions, then the court just has to go through the process of hearing the exceptions. That a court is not uh, on automatic pilot and the regulations don't contemplate automatic pilot. A court is a court of law and justice and therefore a court cannot but be concerned about the legal uh, and justice issues that are raised in these cases. A court uh, is required to determine whether or not the child and the, uh, the, the parents uh, had ordinary residence in the place from which the children were abducted. Uh, that's a factual and a legal question and therefore it has to be, has to be seriously decided. It can't just be assumed. And similarly, if there are risks to the children, those are very serious matters affecting children. They have to be considered in the term. And if that takes time and slows down the process uh, and sometimes leads to a frustration of the overall great scheme of the, uh, of the uh, international law, never forget that behind every case and every individual uh, dispute are human beings and decide those cases fairly and justly in accordance with law. Um, how do you reconcile that obligation with the overall scheme, which, if countries don't conform to the scheme, will bring down the whole pack of cards? That's the question that was concerning me and concerning Justice Nye. And uh, so, that is the issue which presents a sort of paradigm case of the operation of an international principle. Was I being too absolutist? Was I a person who was hard of heart and giving no thought or insufficient thought to the dear little children who should be thought of here? Um, and uh, was that because I had no dear little children of my own that I was purely lost up there in the clouds uh, and uh, concerned only with the uh, theory of international law? Or was I being faithful as a lawyer to the principle of reciprocity and mutuality without which the scheme will not operate? Okay? So that's the question. Any observations? First of all, a big round of applause to the speaker. For <laughs> Don't get carried away. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm very interested in uh, the effectiveness of things like this convention on child production. And uh, I wonder whether these cases highlight the fact that if individual states are just going to superimpose their own view on how these particular issues should be determined, like, is there any chance of, of things like this convention ever really being an effective international law? If you assume international law should encompass the world. 
the um, uh, authorities in The Hague and the special commissions that monitor the convention and the operation take out statistics. And uh, the first observation I'd make on your question is it wasn't really a case of the state. It was a case of courts, independent courts, making their decisions. In fact, after the first case, which I think was the L, uh, where a question of uh, whether the children had expressed uh, a desire to stay in the place of abduction, uh, whether they uh, objected, uh, there was a feeling by the state, that is to say the Attorney General's Department, that the majority in that case had misconstrued what they were intending to say in the regulation, child abduction regulations that gave effect to the Child Abduction Convention and therefore uh, they proposed to the government of the day and the government proposed to Parliament an amendment of the regulations that made it absolutely clear that objection was not to be construed as simply saying, well, look, I'd prefer to stay with mummy here, uh, but was to be a mature expression of a, a strong wish not to be sent away. Uh, and so, in effect, by uh, amending the regulations and by incorporating that clarification, the state was first of all, subscribing to the view I had taken about the meaning of objection, uh, and secondly, giving effect as best it could by the addition of words to what it also saw as the obligation of Australia under the Convention. So I don't think it's fair to blame the state, though of course judges can sometimes share uh, the attitudes of the state. Uh, if I can say so, white Anglo-Saxon countries um, are a bit inclined to think that they're very superior uh, and uh, therefore that uh, to indulge either expressly or, or perhaps subconsciously in a feeling, well, you can't expect those other people with their peculiar legal systems to, to be able to do it as well as we would do it. There's a lot of patriotic writing on this subject in the decisions in the United States of America. Uh, and uh, although in Australia we don't quite get the same patriotic uh, uh, rhetoric, um, a question arises as to whether this, these subconscious feelings of, well, we've got it before us, and there's an exception, and there's a child involved, and therefore we'll make our own decision on that. Yes. With that sense of patriotism or nationalism or sort of legal cultural superiority, does that uh, sort of manifest itself more strongly in this area than perhaps other legal areas, legal disputes that would have, oh, that have an international dimension? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, uh, the attitude of, um, of Justice Scalia in the Supreme Court of the United States is so hostile to any consideration whatsoever of um, the uh, opinions of the international community or of foreign states that he is extremely rude, um, some might say even, with respect to his honour, uh, aggressive and, uh, and um, angry whenever his colleagues make reference to any international principle. Um, now, back in the 1990s, a number of the justices of the Supreme Court of the United States began doing what I was doing in Australia and referring to international uh, principles or the, the decisions of foreign courts um, where there was a, an analogous problem coming up in their final national court. And uh, so, angry and hostile did Justice uh, Scalia's criticisms of his colleagues become that I noted um, a, a, a sudden drop away of any references of this kind 
I mean, if you're going to be lambasted by a colleague, uh, why would you bother? I mean, you, you, the path of safety and low emotion may be by just not going there. And basically, that is what happened in constitutional jurisprudence in the United States of America. I think it arose in a case called Atkin against Virginia, which was a case concerning whether the uh, United States constitutional uh, provision uh, forbidding cruel and unusual punishment uh, would be enlivened in a case where uh, a child uh, under the age of maturity was sentenced to death. That was a question arose. And the majority of the Supreme Court of the United States said, well, look overseas, and in the whole world there are only X countries, I think it was five. They were China, Iran, and other countries that are not normally taken as good analogies to the law. And therefore, if you're thinking of what cruel and unusual punishment means today, it's appropriate to look at those that fact. Well, that turned Justice Scalia ballistic to think, first of all, that you were looking at 